In structural engineering, one of the first steps in your analysis of any building or structure is the determination of loads. Loads come in a large variety of arrangements and assortments, actions, and that's where we're going to start. So let's get going. In structural engineering, as you're computing loads, there's some terminology that we need to get squared away before we can go much further. Loads are classified in many categories. Um, the types of loads are often affect your selection of a particular structure. Um, often, um, uh, an example of this would be, you know, especially in the world of earthquake engineering, uh, seismic loads are often best resisted by, you know, some combination of shear wall systems or you know, very short, stiff structures that are related to the mass and the stiffness. Okay, whereas, you know, in a non-seismic environment where gravity loads, meaning loads that act up and down, these loads can be handled by moment frames or other systems. Now, that's not to say that you can't use, you know, shear wall systems and a gravity system. They're just not as effective in those kind of things. So, um, this will dictate some of the studies that we do later on as we try to try to establish you know a framing pattern and calculate our loads and kind of move into the analysis and the later steps of the process. Generally design loadings are specified by design codes. Um, two major ones in use in the US are the ASCE 710 code and as we talked about in our intro video to this series there is a more recent version but the one that we're talking about is this guy. Okay. And of course let me zoom this out a little bit. Would be this minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. Okay, it's the ASC standard or the ASC um, SCI Structural Engineers Institute. Um, and this particular version is the 2010, which is indicated by our 7 10 up here. There is a, a more recent one than this, but this is the one that's still accepted on most uh, professional engineering exams. And so that's why I've chosen to kind of keep using this one. Um, so, so for this class, um, I'll be giving you excerpts out of this as part of the note packets, and even in the notes that you'll see today, you'll see some scan copies of certain keywords and things that, you know, in the relevant section numbers in this document to be looking at. So that's our, this is where most of the loads come from. Other design codes, you know, whether it's a local building code or an internet, or the IBC, the International Building Code, often will reference back to this, and you'll find that a lot of these documents have um, similar wording on pieces, but where it's different, I'll try to point out some of those differences just to kind of give you kind of a sense of what they're trying to do. So that's the first one. The second one then, as we talked about, is, is the IBC, the 2015 International Building Code. And you can see that this is a pretty, pretty thick book. There's a lot in there. This gets more into, you know, specific requirements for, you know, anything from, you know, steel construction to concrete construction to wood construction, the general layout and all sorts of other building code requirements that are more generally structural, whereas the ASCE 7, the first document I showed you, is all about the competition of the computation of loads. So, um, and, and like, like I said, I will provide some excerpts out of this in the packets as well as we start to go through. All right, so let's zoom this in a little bit, get ourselves back set up. Okay, all right. For specific design codes, the general ones were the two that I just showed you, okay, uh, but there are material specific design codes, things like the concrete code, which is uh, um, the ACI code, ACI 318 covers a lot of the design of concrete members. Um, the AISC, Manual of Steel Construction, covers the design of steel, the NDS is for wood, and then of course for transportation is kind of its own animal, especially with regard to like bridge engineering and those kind of things, which is often a combination of steel and concrete. Um, the, the AJTO or American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, their documentation 
will have different requirements as well. And I'll show you a couple of special ones, particularly with regard to like truck loads and uh, lane loads and, and those kind of things in this video today. Uh, we won't do a whole lot with Ashto outside of that. If you choose to go do the structural engineering exam, they will break, it's often broken down into, you know, bridge engineering, which is Ashto guidelines and everything else, structurally speaking. So there's a lot to the Ashto requirements. It's kind of beyond the scope of an introductory structural engineering class or structural analysis class like what we have here. All right, so the first category of loads that we have is, is what we call the dead loads, okay? And as the name implies, these are loads um, that do not move. They're basically dead, okay? Now, if you look, what I've copied here, this comes out of section 3.1 of the ASC 710 code, as I show right here. So if you've got access to this document, then you can look this up and kind of read the, the specific wording. But it basically deals with... Um, any loads that are considered as permanent, that are not easily or often moved, okay? Um, and that the fact that dead loads are very highly predictable. Because remember, loads, for the most part, come and go, right? You know, if you have occupancy of people inside of a room in a building, you know, say your classroom or something, during class, they're in the room, and then when the class is over, they get up and they move out. So there's a large variability in both location and magnitude associated with those. Dead loads is considered to be loads that don't often change. It could be things like, you know, the weight of the concrete slab on the floor, the weight of the walls, things that you don't expect to be moving around on you on a regular basis. It's not like vehicular traffic or people traffic or wind or even snow for that matter. Okay, and so so these dead loads are something permanent. Now you can get into situations. Well, what about you know like in a in a manufacturing environment, a really big machine that is you know that is installed for you know you know six months at a time. You know, say a, a printing you know, not, not printing press, but a manufacturing press, or you know some sort of injection mold or something in an automotive plant. Those kind of things that weigh you know that could weigh many many tons. Well, technically, if they're moving in and out, they're considered as a live load. But if they're permanent and not easily moved, you can actually get away with calling them as dead loads as well. So there's some interpretation to, to, to what happens here. But generally speaking, I look to define loads as being you know dead loads if they're you know either the material that the object is made out of you know and will not move, or if they're you know when they're quasi permanent that you can't change in a weekend when you re you know when you retool a. Know, you know, a production line or something like that. It's kind of the, the general rule of thumb for what I use to design those. Um, dead loads come in two varieties. Okay, some come in um, are what we call volumetric loads. Okay, meaning that they're based on the specific weight or the density of the material. And so um, they will be usually measured in, at least in U.S. units, as some pounds per cubic foot. That's the abbreviation that you see happening here, this PCF. Okay. Um, and generally, it's basically it's the weight of a one foot by one foot cube of that particular material. Now, even within materials like concrete, there's some variation. You know, well, it depends on the amount of coarse aggregate or the amount of the sand that's in it. Uh, lightweight concrete is typically somewhere around 110 pounds per cubic foot, whereas normal weight concrete, which is generally the most common, is probably closer to 150. Okay, uh, steel weighs almost 500 pounds a cubic foot, kind of the accepted number is 490. And then soil, you know, which again, this depends on, well, is it a wet soil or a dry soil or all sorts of variation is commonly accepted to be in the neighborhood of about 110. Okay, so if I know the density or the specific weight of the material, this gamma value, then I can quickly calculate the weight of the object for based off of that particular, um, that, that particular distance. Um, so, for example, if we had a normal weight concrete block, you know, it's 150 pounds per cubic foot, and it's a one foot by one foot, you know that that weighs 150 pounds. If the wall is 10 feet long and 10 feet high and one foot thick, then you can alter the dimensions accordingly, and that can quickly get you to, you know, to a weight or a dead load associated with that particular object. Now, here's one of the problems that we have with that is what happens if you have you know, a very big wall load such as this that's, you know, maybe 20, 30 feet long. Well, it doesn't make sense that this structure to take all of the load of this wall and combine it into a single weight acting at the centroid and apply it to a structure, right? Because you're penalizing the structure that's supporting that wall at the point where you, you put the modeling or uh, the point load on this. Whereas maybe it's better to model this as some sort of distributed load over a particular length, okay? And so there are loads... Um, that will be coming across. And in fact, most live loads will fall into this category of what we call area loads. 
Now for dead loads, it can be a vertical dead load or it could be a horizontal dead load. I've, I've chosen to show you an example of a wall load, if you will. Okay, that maybe the wall is 10 foot high, it's 30 feet long, and it's eight inches thick, you know. And so these area loads then would be expressed in terms of pounds per square foot. And I apologize, we have some thunderstorms rolling through. So make the video a little bit more exciting, right? Um, okay, so what's happening is, is that um, area loads are expressed in PSF, which is pounds per square foot, okay? And things like, you know, uniform objects that are repeatedly used, you know, maybe it's a, you know, a four inch uh, masonry unit, uh, a house brick, the brick on the outside of your house, okay? Well, a four inch thick masonry unit would have a four inch dimension here, okay? But then we would specify, depending on the length of the wall and the height of the wall, that would be how I would start to calculate the dead load associated with it. So these area loads are associated with as 40 PSF. Okay, um, eight-inch masonry units, which would be more like a, like a like a larger brick or a, a, you know non-grout filled concrete block. This would be more like 80 pounds per square foot, and you've got to be careful on this one that you know for non-grout filled, what we're saying is is that if your masonry brick has two basic cores in it, okay, look like something kind of like that. Non-grout fill means that there's nothing inside these cores, that it's just a hollow section. But if you start to fill that with grout or concrete or something in order to increase the strength, well, then this number changes. So you have to be very careful on, well, do I assume it's non-grout or, or grout filled? So that can be another, another tricky issue. So you've got to be very careful in the specifications of the materials and what's being used. Because if you design your structure for non-grout filled and the construction workers fill it, well, they just increased your loads on you, and so you've got to be a little bit more careful. So just be, be mindful of some of the little pitfalls that can happen there as well. Um, other common construction materials, things like plaster, are assumed to be, you know, for a nominal thickness, uh, five pounds per square foot. Glass, okay, as an estimate for residential constructions, this will vary with the thickness, and glass can get quite heavy, but for normal, you know, windows in, say, your house or, or a commercial building, an eight pounds per square foot is generally a pretty good first estimate to get you going. Now again, a lot of the numbers I'm giving you are just preliminary numbers. You won't know them until after you've done the final design and the final selection. But as a structural engineer, if we're just trying to set up, you know, the, the building framing and the size of the columns and the size of the beams, then I need to be a little bit more, uh, you know, I, I need a number to get started. And so that's what all these numbers that I'm showing you are all just, you know, preliminary numbers. You have to do a final analysis and recheck things at the end once everything has been constructed or has been fully specified, but at this point we're just kind of trying to get our feet wet and under us. Um, wood framing is a little bit of a different animal. If you think about wood framing, generally that's, you know, you have some sort of, you know, two by four construction where the two by fours themselves are, are located, you know, usually these are on 16 inches on center and they're two by fours and, you know, well, again, depending on the length of the wall and the height of the wall, well, what I don't want to have to do is go in and calculate, well, this is at, you know, at zero, this is at 16 inches, the next one's at 32, the next one's at 48, and come in and calculate a point load for every single one of these wall studs. I don't want to do that. So we kind of cheat a little bit and kind of come up with an average value for wood framing. Okay, and so for a wall that is made out of two by fours and eight feet tall, 16 inches on center, you know, this would be kind of, there will be, depending on the properties of the wood, a, a PSF value will be given to you for a construction, something like this. Okay, um, other things that will uh, might be area loads would be things like um, mechanical mechanical fixtures, you know, you know, piping or you know, HVAC, you know, conduit or something, and they specify it as a PSF because you don't want to, you know, you know, impart on the you know, on the guys in the field, you know, that they have to put that, you know, two-inch pipe at a, the exact location. They're Based on their, you know, in-field considerations, they want some variability to be able to locate things within kind of a range of areas. So we design things, over-design them for, you know, some sort of area load, and that's kind of one of the, the, the information that we have. Now, depending on the size of the conduit or the size of the pipe, you'll have to consult the vending uh, the vendor's supply diagrams to get those particular values. And so you're constantly, as a structural engineer, chasing down loads or, or weights. So the values I've given you here are all, again, preliminary values, but you'll want to, to get the, the, true, the true specifications for, for, the, for, for the vendors. Okay. All right. So that's kind of how we kind of work with area loads. And I'll, I'll have an example. We'll kind of work with 
here in a little bit that kind of sets all of this up for you to be able to kind of figure out how things are designed. And then what do we do with the loads afterwards? All right, so that's our dead load description. Okay, the next category is our live loads. Um, okay, and basically, you know, where dead loads were the loads where some are permanent, well then live loads are ones that aren't. Okay, basically they can relocate on a regular basis. You know, it could be, you know, office equipment like tables and chairs that get scooted around, or, you know, we talked about people loads, or we talked about vehicle loads. All of those can be live loads. They're, live, they're loads that don't last very long in their current location or have a high degree of movability. You know, things on wheels are definitely a live load, okay? And so what we've got is we've got some, um, we'll show you some IDC references here in a little while, okay? But the, the section associated with live loads, this is where the IDC will step in, is they have a specification 1607.1 from that IDC book that I showed you that specifies for a lot of, um, common use type of situations um, okay things like you know classrooms are 40 pounds per square foot um, you might have offices in here of 50 pounds per square foot and generally offices are a little bit heavier than classrooms because there's heavier equipment things like copiers and you know, stacks of paper and boxes in the, in the shelf or in the corner. You know, there's just generally the loads on an office are generally something, somewhat a little bit more larger. Classrooms are 40 pounds per square foot. Residences, your house, is typically designed for 40 pounds per square foot for a normal two to four person single family dwelling house. Okay, now, things like balconies and gathering areas may be designed for something larger as well. Um, so, so those will all be some common values that you'll see. Classrooms are 40, and school corridors are 80. And that's kind of an interesting one because, well, why do you think that is? You know, why are corridors double what the classroom is? And it has to do, if you think about the flow of people, you know, during a class, let's just kind of do a little sketch here. But here's my classroom. I'm only going to put one, a single door on this thing, right? And then here's my hallway outside of the classroom on this. You know, when people are sitting in here, we just said that's 40 pounds per square foot. Okay, well, common etiquette in the U.S. is that when a class is in session, if people start to show up early, where do they congregate? They wait outside in the corridor or out in the hallway, right? And then common courtesy says that you, we typically wait for the people in the classroom to leave before we go in to take our spot in the next class, right? And so all of this 40 pounds per square foot now moves out in the hallway the people that were waiting, if everybody shows up, is also 40 pounds per square foot. So I get a 40 plus 40 here. That's kind of the logic of what's happening. And that 40 plus 40 then is the 80. Okay, and so that's kind of the way that this is starting to kind of lay out. That, you know, all of these people are now moving out of the room into the hallway. And so the hallway regions get a heavier load. You know, there's also not counting the fact that people moving back and forth in the hallway while classes are going as well. So you can get larger values that way. And so 80 is what the IBC is, is recommending. Okay, and so that's kind of what we're showing kind of here, all right, that you know, we have our hallway, 40 pounds per square foot, and I have 40 per, pounds per square foot in the room. And then when this room starts to unload, okay, we now have zero in the room, and then I have 40 plus the 40 or 80 out in the hallway. Okay, and what you will find out is, is that the arrangement of these loads is that, you know, I have a 40-40 combo here, okay, and then I have an 80-0 combo here, and either one is equally likely to occur. So I now have multiple load cases that we have to be able to analyze, and so it's not uncommon that, you know, it's part of a, you know, part of a structural analysis that I'll run both cases, especially if I have, you know, depending on how I framed it or, you know, if this is an elevated classroom or office building or something like that. So, so there are multiple cases show up because of the nature of the live loads. You have to look at all the combinations or all the permutations of where the loads are at a given instance. And this can make, these guys can make, you know, your loads, you know, significantly more complex. Imagine, you know, you're in a, in a workshop and have like a crane or something that's moving back and forth down a rail beam and at some time it's got a load and that crane can be anywhere along the length of the building. Okay, at the exact instant that you're analyzing a structure for a windstorm or analyzing it for a snowstorm, these combinations become very, very complex. And so there will be some rules and some guidelines that we'll talk about on how do we put these parts together. All right, so, so that's kind of our general arrangement of the live loads. Okay, and for the purposes of this class, we're not going to go a whole lot further on live loads than just knowing these PSF numbers that I show here. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, uh, one of the other pages that's in your packet that we have for you is kind of some listing of common materials and these are um, 
uh, come from different sources. The IDC has a table. The ASE code has a table. I've got another summary table. I always kind of fall back on to give me some more, more, more issues. The the one thing to notice that in whatever table you choose to pull out, and these are dead loads, is you always have to look over here and you have to look at the units. This is a PSF. Okay, so these values are PSF. So these are area load kind of calculations. Okay, so you know we've got things like you know acoustical tile hanging from the ceiling. I've got you know gypsum drywall. Um, we get down into, you know, here's our four inch brick, our, our eight inch CMU. Uh, this one even has 12 inch on its table. And you can see there's a little bit of a difference in the values that I was showing you. But again, it kind of depends on your resource. You have to use your engineering judgment to say, does this make sense? Okay, um, you'll see things like two by four wood studs with half inch GWB. GWB is gypsum wall board, all right? Okay, on both sides. So that would be the assembly of the wood studs plus the sheeting that goes on the outside of it. Um, and then we get into things like roofing materials, is it, you know, asphalt shingles, copper, slate roofs, and you can see some of these get pretty large, like, you know, like a clay tile roof, you know, would be, could be as much as 20 pounds per square foot, whereas just your single asphalt shingles, like on your normal house, is only more like 2.8 2 or 3. So, again, depending on the construction materials. And this could be some problems, especially when dealing with architects, that if, you know, an owner wants something and then later changes their mind, you know, say originally they had called for asphalt shingles and you designed it for three and then later on down the process after you're working up your design details they come back and say well we decided we want to go with you know kind of a you know a spanish mission style roof which has you know clay tile on the roof itself and all of a sudden they just mess with your loads and that could drastically change your design so these are the kind of things these big differences are what you want to try to avoid in a design project uh, you know later on okay now if I know that asphalt shingles are three, maybe I design it for three and a half or four, and then they change their mind and go to something else, well, maybe I don't get burned nearly as badly on that decision. Okay, so again, there's some engineering judgment, there's some crudeness to the way that we're setting this up, but that's the purpose of what these sheets and what these estimates are. So one of the homework assignments that you'll be working with has to do with you know, calculating the dead loads of a particular structure. Okay? All right. All right. And with that, we will stop our discussion there for dead loads, and I will see you next time when we get to live loads.